And later on, we'll be talking about Oliver Cromwell's warts and their effect on socio-economic history of the late 17th century. But now, for those of you that like your history just a little bit more exciting, here's Wizzo's rip-roaring history. I'm Steve Wizzo Wisdom and I'm really into our history. Not just the normal stuff like kings and battles, but the really obscure, strange and downright bizarre stories that turn our history into a real rip-roaring adventure. With the help of my trusty Riley motor car and a few old motoring atlases, I'll be driving the highways and byways of England in search of those really interesting stories from the past they just didn't teach us at school. Now, I know I'm not one of those traditionally good-looking TV presenters who walks around poking the occasional ruin and looking ever so slightly like an advert for shampoo, but I am a very hands-on kind of historian. I like nothing more than rolling up my sleeves and getting my fingers dirty, testing out any recreated object of the past that historical build-anything expert and old mate Steve Ralphie Ralphs has whipped up for me in his workshop. No time to hang around though, start the engines. We're going to head to the coast and try out this ancient brass and copper diving helmet as used by everybody from Alexander the Great right through to the Tudors to explore wrecks like the Mary Rose. There's just one thing I want to know though, does it actually work? Well, there's only one way to find out. Time to lose, and I'm on the road again to sample the delights of the Tommy Atkins diet. I whip up a meal fit for Lord Kitchener himself using a recipe book designed to make soldiers' rations go further and taste nicer. It's ready, steady cook in mud. That's simmering away quite nicely. So while it's doing that, me and Ralphie are going to go down to the workshop and look at some of that really interesting trench trivia and first war fact. Like, did the Germans really project images of angels onto clouds at the Battle of Mons to spook out their British opponents? Do you know, that's not bad. Here, Sarge, do you fancy a sip of my... 300-year-old bottle of human urine and hair, as used by superstitious 17th century country folk as a kind of home insurance against their place being attacked by witches. They also use these strange and eerie magical symbols here on this beam. But if you think that's odd, have a look at this really rather grisly, shriveled up and mummified cat, dried by the passing of the centuries. These poor unfortunate creatures were pushed under thatch or nailed under floorboards to serve as a good luck charm in the houses where they were put. But you want to know the worst thing. Sometimes, Kitty here was still alive. Ooh, which is more than I'll be. Ooh, and if I don't shape up here at the world's only gladiatorial themed fitness centre, just outside Rome, for a bit of a workout, Spartacus style. I've been eating their muscle building barley porridge having my oiled skin scraping sold to epileptics as a cure. OW! And we'll be looking at some of the better bits of being a gladiator also. So as I, Russell Crowe style, jog up the tunnel to the arena beyond, is any of my training going to be enough to take me through ten rounds with a rather large opponent? Oh no! This bloke's built like a... Blooming great Sherman tank! But why do we call them tanks? I take a trip to not so rip roaring Norfolk and get an answer to this 90 year old mystery. When I'm not being run over by 36 tonnes of rolling steel war machine. I'm out with Leonardo da Vinci's frankly incredible armoured tank design from the year 1502. As tall as a house and powered by muscles alone, I'll be seeing whether its wooden cranks and steel and bronze armour plating would have stood up to the weapons of the day. Could this rip-roaring machine have revolutionised the Renaissance battlefield as did its iron cousin some 500 years later? Blimey, he's getting a bit close! I think it's time to make money! Escape for air crews shot down over Germany seemed an impossibility, but many did evade capture, helped by miniature navigational aids. <laughs> the thing is, did any of this James Bond gadgetry actually ever help an air crew member get back to dear old Blighty? Well, I've got my button compass, a silk map of the area, and a 1940s bar of chocolate. The problem is, I've got 10 ex-SAS trackers on my tail. It's dark, and I'm wearing flying clothing. Hit it! <laughs> And if 
if you did end up captured and in the bag, just how difficult was it digging those Great Escape style tunnels when all you had <laughs> was a spade made from a tin can? Time to go, I think. Time to go indeed, but what rip-roaring facts will I be looking at later? Finding out just exactly what is in that little urn of ashes. Oh. I'll be digging the dirt on some of Britain's grisliest battlefields. Ooh, nasty. Meeting the medieval rat on trial for vandalism. Seeing if I have the right stuff to be an astronaut. And freezing my bits off in the footsteps of Captain Scott. As the old car springs into life once more, my quest for our rip-roaring history goes on. Anywhere that the old Riley can take me. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Goodbye to you. In 1066, suitable kings of England were like buses. You wait for one, and then three come along at once. It was all going so well with the old one, Edward the Saxon, but then he only goes and dies. We need a replacement. Trouble is, there's three takers for the job. First, you've got the homegrown variety, Harold Godwinson the Saxon, the most powerful man in England. Then, to make things confusing, you've got another Harold, the Norwegian. And then you've got Duke William of Normandy, from France. They all seem to think they're the right man for the job, but Harold, being nearest I guess, manages to get his feet under the table quickest. We have a new king, Harold II. Well, you can imagine what the language was like in France, and in Norway the air was probably turning blue. There's nothing else for it, say the jilted others. We're going to invade. The Norwegians turn up first, up here in Yorkshire, and get soundly thrashed by King Harold's lot. William landed near Hastings, but the Saxon army was still up north. They had to slog it down south. The two armies finally met at Senlac Hill. Harold's tired men, feet aching from legging it down south, got the high ground, with William's men facing them in the valley below. When it finally kicked off, the Saxons were such an impregnable mass that nothing the Normans could do could break in. As long as they stayed where they were, they couldn't lose. Which is just what they didn't do. William's plan was a simple trick. He ordered his men to run away as though scared. We've got them now, lads, say the victorious Saxons, and break ranks in pursuit. With the Saxon army in the open, it was easy work for the Normans to cut them down from horseback. It was only a matter of time before Harold himself got hit. Was it an arrow in the eye? Nobody knows. But you can read about it all in the Bayer Tapestry, the world's first comic strip. Pure as the driven snow. What a charming expression until you find out pure was a Victorian word for dog dirt. So, pity the poor person who was paid to walk the streets picking up pure. That's right, gathering dog muck for a living. Picture the scene. Victorian London, the Houses of Parliament, Tower Bridge, cobbled streets, covered in faeces. Not so good for folks who don't look where they're walking. Great news for the leather industry. Pure was what they called dog muck. They used it because it contained leftover acids and enzymes from the dog's stomach, perfect for making leather soft and flexible. So the pure collectors had to go around picking up the poo. All day long come rain or shine, up to their elbows in stinking dog muck. But it does get worse. The excrement got carted off to the leather factory, where it was mixed with urine to make a kind of foul-smelling excrement soup. In went the animal skins. Imagine the stench. Imagine harder. Sometimes they boiled it up. Revolting as this cocktail must have been, it did produce valuable leather. 
a process called tanning. So, if your surname's Tanner, you'll now know why. I think this is going to be a lovely shade of brown. Thank you.